Hello, book two. And welcome back to a chapter-by-chapter read-through of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. We started months and months ago with The Two Towers and moved on to The Return of the King, and now we've gone back to the first part of the book, The Fellowship of the Ring. But we're still a long way off from the founding of any kind of fellowship. We're still dealing with our main characters, four hobbits. Frodo, who is bearing the One Ring of Power, Sauron the Great, Sauron the Dark Lord in, in Mordor, created this ring and infused it with a huge amount of his own malignant energy. And it has been lost for eons and is now found again and is in the possession of a hobbit named Frodo, who is leaving the Shire. He's leaving his peaceful, bucolic home in order to bring this thing somewhere. The short-term goal is Rivendell, a citadel of the elves. The long-term goal has actually been said which is, you know, to destroy this thing, to bring it to the cracks of doom in Mordor and throw it in. The only thing that would destroy it. But no one's really talking about that in this part of the book. They're mainly talking about just getting out of the Shire safe because they're being followed. They're being watched by riders in black who seem extremely creepy and extremely threatening. But as we saw last time, our heroes have decided to, to uh, baffle their pursuit and also maybe take a shortcut by going through the old forest a section of wood outside of the Shire that is very, very old and deeply intergrown and sun blotting and it turns out also sentient and malevolent. It doesn't like two-legged people. It doesn't like people that use axes. Uh, and one of the trees eats two of the hobbits, tries to swallow them whole, tries to take them inside its bark. And those hobbits are saved by a creature named Tom Bombadil, by a a person, a new character named Tom Bombadil, who shows up and simply orders the, the tree to let them go. And the tree does. <laughs> uh, Tom Bombadil and his, his, the lady of his household, Goldberry, they re routinely refer to him as master. That he is master. And in his own domain, his songs are strongest. They, things do what he says. We, we saw last time that he gives the hobbits a wonderful, enchanted time in the house of Tom Bombadil, and also gives them a bit of a shock, because the magic ring that Frodo has that was introduced in The Hobbit, the, the, it's introduced in, in Tolkien's children's book, The Hobbit, and the fun thing about it in The Hobbit is that when you put it on, you turn invisible. Uh, and Tom puts the ring on, and he does not vanish. And not only that, but when Frodo puts the ring on and does vanish, Tom can still see him. This is... It doesn't strike the first-time reader as, as amazing as it actually is. We don't know as much about the ring as we're going to know. The more you know, the further along in the book you go, the more you look back on what Tom Bombadil can do and are amazed. Uh, but even so, we know that Gandalf feared to even touch this thing. And here, Bombadil can make a mockery of it. He, it doesn't affect him in any way. He isn't prone to its effects on others. Uh... They have a wonderful evening, and then the next day, Tom is of the same opinion as Gildor and the elves, everybody that the hobbits have met, which is that you've got to keep going. You're being followed. Speed is of the essence, so you're not welcome. I mean, it's nice of you. You are your guests are your honored guests, and we loved you, but you have to go. You have to keep going. Uh, so they do. They reluctantly say goodbye to Tom Bombadil, and they do. They go on their way and eventually end up in this chapter. This chapter is, uh, can we get the, uh, the number correct <laughs> for once? Uh, this is chapter 8, Fog on the Barrow Downs. And eventually, they walk for a while up hill and dale. It's more walking for the Lord of the Rings. And eventually, they get to the Barrow Downs. And they think that things are going okay. They get to a high plateau, in the middle of which is one solitary stone that's standing upright. It's obviously not a natural feature, and they sort of take a nap. Maybe a little helped. Maybe a little induced to a nap. And uh, the day flies away. And disaster strikes. Because Frodo wakes to find that his friends have been captured. He has been captured, too. By shambling zombie-like creatures. By a barrow white. By a dead body inhabiting a barrow, a crypt. A gigantic above-ground crypt. And this dead body is not only moving around, but it wants to make dead bodies of the hobbits, not by killing them so much outright as by transforming them into Barrow Whites. Frodo wakes up to find his three friends 
have been redressed. They've been dressed in white robes, and they're laying apparently comatose, and side by side on a, on a bier. And there's a sword laying across all three of their throats. They are not awake, and Frodo doesn't know what's going on, but he feels uh, the pluck of courage. There's a really good. Uh, it's put in a really good way. Uh, there is a seed of courage hidden, often deeply, it is true, in the heart of the fattest and most timid hobbit, waiting for some final desperate danger to make it grow. Frodo was neither very fat nor very timid. Indeed, though he did not know it, Bilbo and Gandalf had thought him the best hobbit in the Shire. He thought he had come to the end of his adventure, and a terrible end, but the thought hardened him. He found himself stiffening as if a final spring... He, was no, he no longer felt limp like a helpless prey. But there's not much that he can do. He takes up, uh, he attacks a creeping hand that is, that is sort of menacingly crawling towards his friends. But he doesn't know how many Barrow Whites there are. He doesn't know where they are or what's going on here. In his desperation, he decides to sing a call for help to Tom Bombadil who is a long way away. They've been traveling for the whole of the morning, but no sooner does Frodo sing that song of requiring Tom Bombadil's aid than Bombadil shows up and destroys the Barrow White. The, the walls are ripped apart. Sunlight floods in. The Barrow Whites are not only thwarted, but banished. Bombadil just tells them to get away. Go away. You're not welcome back in your own Barrow. Even when I save these people, you're still gone. It's, I mean, it's one thing. In the House of Tom Bombadil, it's one thing for us to see Bombadil play games with the ring. After all, we don't know much about the ring. And it's one thing for him to have a way with the trees on his own country. Granted, Sam and Frodo couldn't get Merry and Pippin free of the tree, but it doesn't seem all that remarkable that Bombadil could. Uh, but this? <laughs> this is something very different. This is something very, very different. This is a glimpse of a kind of power that we have not seen any character show. And I would argue we're not going to see many characters show this kind of thing. It's, this, is, this is Gandalf or Saruman level power. Uh, Bombadil helps Frodo and Bombadil take their friends out and wake them up. Bombadil also goes inside and they hear the sound of stomping and smashing because he's just destroying the Barrowites that are in there. They don't have a chance. They don't. There's no fight going on. That's the thing about Bombadil, is that in his own kingdom, which, uh, which has boundaries that only he can see, nothing dismays him. He is master. Uh, and he comes out of the Barrow Down bearing a bunch of things, a bunch of treasures that have been just smoldering in there forever. He seems to think that the best thing to do for them would be to put them on a stone and just let them out in the open air, let creatures, wayfarers, anybody come by and do what they want with it. But he also parcels out some things to Frodo and his friends, specifically daggers. That are daggers for big people, but they, for a hobbit, they are a sword. They're, they're the size of a sword. And Bombadil remembers these things. He picks a little, a little jeweled brooch that he's going to bring home to Goldberry. And he remembers it. It's thousands of years old, and he remembers what it, what the, where these things were originally. He knows all about this country. He barely hints at it, but he knows all about this country. Uh, and tells Frodo and Sam and Merry and Pippin that these weapons were forged by the men of Westerness in a previous age. They are not like mo uh, normal mortal metalworking at all. We're going to see that play an important role. That's going to come up over and over again in the book. Uh, our friends recover. And Bombadil goes off and brings them a string of ponies so they can go on their way. And he agrees that he will take them, he'll go with them, to the border of his land. And he does, singing the whole time, making merry the whole time, but still urging them to keep going, keep hurrying. He tells them, I don't have any, I am not master of black riders out of Mordor. Uh, so, you know, you can't stay here. And shouldn't, anyway. So that is this chapter. It's kind of, a, in a way, a bridging chapter, because it starts with our heroes embarking, and it ends with our heroes embarking. But they do have an adventure, and we get one last glimpse of Tom Bombadil. We are never actually going to see Tom Bombadil again in this book. You, the little that you know of him, we know that he remembers the Man of Westerness. We know that he knows the history of the whole land that he's in. 
Every detail, is, it's a sad history, he doesn't want to talk about it, but we know that he knows it. We know that he saw it happen. And on, a, on top of that, he has an amazing amount of supernatural power uh, and physical power. And that's it. That's all you're ever going to learn about Tom Bombadil. So if you're reading this for the first time, uh, try not to dwell on that too much. He's not coming back. You're not, you're not going to get the further adventures of Tom Bombadil, unfortunately. Uh, so that's where this chapter ends. We, we are, our heroes are on the road again. There's one interesting bit here, one, one little foreshadowing of uh, when Bombadil is talking about the men of Western S and these, these lost fallen kingdoms. He talks about how there are still kings wandering in the wilderness without crowns and without kingdoms. He's obviously referring to the rangers. And one in particular, we're told that Frodo almost sees them in a vision. And one of the last one that he sees has a, a crown with a bright star on it. That Frodo doesn't know it, but uh, Tolkien is uh, is skillfully preparing the ground for the meeting of uh, a hidden king of Aragorn. Uh, so we're we're moving on next time. We have left the danger of the Barrow Downs behind. So we are moving on next time uh, to Bree, to the village of Bree, and to the inn of the Prancing Pony. The, this is, the next will be chapter 9. This is at the sign of the Prancing Pony. Uh, so we'll do that next time, uh, and I will adjourn for now. <laughs> I will see you then. <laughs> Thank you, Book 2.